Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Petrobras' stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Petrobras operates in three business areas. The first is exploration and production, the second is refining, transportation and marketing, and the third is gas and power. It controls significant oil and energy assets all over the world, although Brazil represents a majority of its production. Most of the oil and gas consumed in Brazil comes from this company. It has large amounts of reserves, mainly in Brazil, in order to optimize its infrastructure and limit cost of exploration, development, and production. It has developed technical knowledge in deep water exploration and production from almost 50 years of working in Brazil's offshore basins. It does go beyond oil and gas exploration and production. It transports oil and gas to its refineries and gas treatment units in order to supply the best products. A majority of the refining capacity is in Brazil. It is also involved in the production of petrochemicals through its subsidiaries. The company distributes oil products through wholesalers and retailers. It also participates in the Brazilian natural gas market, including the logistics, distribution, and processing of natural gas. The company is also trying to get heavily involved in renewable energy. They're headquartered in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and was founded in 1953. The ticker trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Bursa, Mexican Bolsa, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Spanish Bolsa, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 94 billion market cap. They're trading at $14 a share, and they have 6.5 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Their free cash flow more than doubles from 14 billion up to over 31 billion. Oil and gas companies have been knocking it out of the park in 2021 and also into 2022. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That also peaks in 2021 at close to $20 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company and that was higher in 2018 but they're so much more profitable in 2020 with lower revenue. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are all the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The cost to pull the oil through exploration and production is part of cost of revenue. Also, all the costs to refine the oil are part of cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and that was highest in 2021 at $41 billion. Below that is their operating expenses. They spend a lot in R&D, research and development. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income, and that doubled from 2020. But their revenue did not double, so you can see how high their margins are. They spent $5 billion of interest on their debt, which was a lot lower than 2019 and 2020. Then you have other income and expenses. These are all the gains or losses not part of the company's core operations. These big negatives are asset impairments. Then you have your pre-tax income, then your taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is your net income. And they have positive net income every year, and it's huge in 2020 at 20 billion. This is the company's income statement directly from their website. In 2021, they had 84 billion of revenue. All their numbers are in US dollars. Of the 84 billion of revenue, 62 billion is from the domestic market in Brazil. 23 billion is from outside Brazil. Here is a breakdown of by product. 24 billion in diesel, 12 billion in gasoline. Diesel is thicker than regular gas, so it's more efficient. Only 3% of cars in the US use diesel. But outside the US, it's far more. In Europe, it's over 50%. Liquefied petroleum gas is 4.5 billion. I know farming equipment uses liquefied petroleum gas. And jet fuel is 2.3 billion. An example of something that uses naphtha are solvents. Fuel oil, and that includes bunker fuel, which is used on ships. Six billion of natural gas and three billion of electricity. Their cost of revenue is 43 billion, so their gross profit is 41 billion. They have amazing gross margins, 49%, that's gross profit over revenue. The average in their industry is 33%, and their net margins are 24%. The average in their industry is only 1%. Their biggest expense is marketing, 4.2 billion. 
GNA 1.2 billion, exploration, R&D. They passed through lots of impairments. A positive 3.2 billion last year was a negative 7 billion. These are non-cash items, so they get reversed out on the statement of cash flows. Their operating income went up almost four times from 2020, and their net income went up over 20 times. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. 2021 was their best year, generating 38 billion of cash flow, much more than prior years. And of course, they spent a lot on CapEx. These are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. They had so much free cash flow in 2021, they paid a huge dividend. They also had cash left over after the dividend, so they paid down $27 billion of debt. They've been paying down their debt for the past few years. Last year, they paid down $31 billion. Before that, it was $32 billion. Before that, it was $34 billion. They do issue debt each year, but a lot lower than they pay down. This is their operating cash flow section directly from their financial reporting. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net income. Then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. Then adjust for changes in working capital. Operating cash flow is a much better indicator of how the company did than net income. Because you can see in 2020, their net income was under $1 billion, but they actually generated $29 billion of cash flow. The big difference in 2020 was that $7 billion impairment. That's a non-cash item, so we have to add it back here. The report even says reversal of impairment. They passed through a gain in 2021, so that pumped up their net income. But that's a non-cash gain, so we have to minus it out here. I like to track a company's revenue and operating cash flow. That kind of eliminates a lot of the noise and helps you just focus on two numbers. Of course, I look at other numbers, but these two are one of the bigger ones. Their revenue is a bit volatile, but their revenue moves with the price of oil. It was really high in 2015, but I'm pretty sure 2022 is going to be their best year. And their operating cash flow looks great. It's really healthy each year, and currently it's their highest ever. This is their revenue and operating cash flow projection. Their revenue is expected to continue growing in 2022, then stay fairly steady in 23 and 24. I think this is definitely a possibility. And their operating cash flow to remain pretty steady but decline a little bit. This is their investing and financing sections from their statement of cash flows. They spend a lot in CapEx, property, plant, and equipment, six to eight and a half billion dollars a year. This is 2021, 2020, and 2019. They spend 15 billion on a rights agreement. They divested part of their business and received 10 billion. This is in 2019. In 2020, they received 5 billion. They received 2.9 billion from one of its subsidiaries. In 2021, in their investing section, they had a cash inflow. In their financing section, they pay down lots of debt, 21 to $27 billion a year. And look how big their dividend is in 2021, $13 billion, compared to prior years of $1.4 billion or $1.9 billion. Because they're so flush with cash, they need to do something with it, so they give it back to their investors. In their financing section, they had a cash outflow of $41 billion. This is the equity section on their 1231 balance sheet. They have $69 billion of equity. They raised $107 billion from selling their business. They profited $73 billion from running their business. And they have an accumulated other comprehensive deficit of $112 billion. These are unrealized losses the company may realize in the future. Let's look at the capital structure. $69 billion of equity, $59 billion of debt. They're 54% equity, 46% debt. Their net debt is $48 billion. This blue line is their equity balance since 2015. The red line is their debt balance, and the green line is their cash balance. They've really strengthened their capital structure and balance sheet over the years. Look at the red line decrease over time, and now their equity balance is higher than their debt balance. For many years, they had higher debt than equity. It's not the end of the world if you have more debt than equity, although it's not ideal. And their cash balance is pretty consistent each year. I gave them a whack of 14.5% because investing in Brazilian companies tends to be more risky than investing in most other countries. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's $177 billion. 
we discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital and we get a value of the company of 169 billion dollars we divide that by 6.5 billion shares and we get a calculated stock price of 26 dollars they're trading at 14 dollars so they're trading at a 44 percent discount it's a buy according to the model i did a video on this company back in november they were trading at $10, my valuation was $19. The stock has come up about 50% since my video, but my stock valuation is even higher now because the company did so well in the fourth quarter. Their revenue is projected to increase 7.7%, so I grew their revenue 7.7% for the next four years. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To calculate their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these four free cash flow numbers and I divided by the sum of these four revenue numbers. That comes out to 23%. And I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 23%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. And the model doesn't seem too aggressive. Their free cash flows are lower than 2020 and a lot lower than 2021. So this does seem achievable. The website simply Wall Street values the company exactly where they're trading at. Only one analyst priced this stock and their price target was 1420. This is where the stock has been trading the last five years. It was over $15 back in 2018 and 2019. Then it dropped a lot when oil became negative. Imagine getting it for $5. Your dividend yield would be close to 100%. But the stock has tripled since the bottom. And it just keeps going up because oil prices keep rising. This bottom chart is the price of oil the past five years. So you can see their stock price is fairly correlated with the price of oil. And oil is getting up to $100 a barrel. If it keeps rising, you're gonna keep making money with this company. If you bought this stock and the S&P 500 five years ago, they would have been pretty similar up until the beginning of 2020. Then after that, you can see the S&P is up 80% in five years. This stock is up 41%. But this chart does not include dividends. If you add the dividends in, they would be a lot closer. They have a beta of 1.31, so the stock is not too volatile. It's up 91% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 14%. The 52-week low is 7, the high is 15. The stock is on a major uptick, trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. And you can see lots of people like this stock. Well over 30 million shares are traded each day. Of the 6.5 billion shares outstanding, 4.1 billion are on float. 22% are held by institutions, and 1% of the shares are shorted. They've done two stock splits in their history, a two-for-one in 2007 and another two-for-one in 2008. Look how low their dividend was before 2021, $0.09, cents, $0.10, cents, $0.03. Cents now it's well over a dollar their dividend yield is 12 and a half percent which they can afford it's 59 percent of their net income 37 percent of their free cash flow this is their dividend yield and dividend per share since 2011 and they pretty much track each other which is pretty impressive and their dividend wasn't that high for many years at one point it was almost nothing but now their dividend is huge and expected to continue growing. Their employee count has come up a lot since 2019. They employ over 49,000 people. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $7,000 today. 10 years ago would have been a bad time to buy it. But if you bought the stock one year ago, you would have been close to tripling your money. 37% of the company is held by institutions, 29% by the government of Brazil, 26% by the general public, and 8% by venture capital and private equity firms. The government of Brazil is their biggest shareholder at 29%. They have 3.7 billion shares valued at $55 billion. So you know the government of Brazil is going to make sure this company is successful. The Brazilian Development Bank, this is overseen by the government of Brazil. They own 8% of the company, then BlackRock, Capital Research, and GQG Partners. Let's look at their financial ratios. A PE below 5, which is almost unheard of, a price to sales of 1.1, and a price to book of 1.4. Let's look at their non-current assets. 1.9 billion of receivables. This is how much money other companies owe this company. They have 8 billion of judicial deposits. The Brazilian government ordered this company to put funds aside for taxes. And they also have 3.3 billion of other recoverable taxes. Let's look at their non-current liabilities. 32 billion of debt, 18 billion of leases, 1.2 billion of deferred income taxes. This will increase their tax bill in the future. 
9.4 billion they owe to their employees. Decommissioning costs are the cost related to removing or selling an asset. And here's a breakdown of the 16 billion. 900 million in onshore, 3.7 billion in shallow waters, 8.4 billion in deep and ultra deep post salt, and 2.6 billion in pre-salt. So these costs are related to their onshore and offshore basins. They have a great return on invested capital of 22%. They can cover the interest payments with their operating income nearly seven times, a really high ROE of 29%. They can cover their current liabilities with their current assets. They have a current ratio of 1.2. Their quick ratio is a little below one. Let's look at their current assets, 10 and a half billion of cash, 6 billion of receivables. This is how much money other companies owe this company. Since it's in the current section, it's owed within 12 months, 7 billion of inventory, 1.2 billion of recoverable taxes and 1.6 billion of other. They are planning on selling assets. The value of those assets are two and a half billion dollars. So it's separated out. When an asset is held for sale, it's not depreciated. The dollar amount on the balance sheet is always the lower of the carrying value and the fair value. Carrying value is the value according to the balance sheet which means it's based off of the original price minus depreciation. Fair value is the value you can buy the asset in the open market. Let's look at their current liabilities, five and a half billion of payables. This is how much money this company owes other companies. 3.6 billion of debt, 5.4 billion of leases. They owe the Brazilian government almost 5 billion in taxes. They owe their employees 2.1 billion, 1.9 billion of other. The assets that are held for sale have debt attached to it, and that debt is $900 million. They generated over $31 billion of free cash flow in 2021, and they have nearly $6 billion of working capital, plus they pay out about $12 billion of dividend payments. But they still have a ton of excess funding, over $25 billion. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 19 companies in the same industry as Petrobras, and they rank 6th in market cap. The average is 77 billion, they're 94 billion. They pay the highest dividend of all the companies. They generate a ton of free cash flow. The only company that generates more is Exxon. You can see how undervalued the stock is. A 4.7 PE, a 3.0 price to free cash flow, and a 1.1 price to sales. This type of stock is always gonna be undervalued when you look at the price multiples because they're located in Brazil. They don't have as much upside as a company like Exxon or even Total Energies. France is a lower credit risk than Brazil. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 44% discount. As long as the price of oil keeps going up, which I think it will, I heard someone say $300 a barrel. It's never been that high before, but I could see $200 a barrel because many countries in Eastern Europe are gonna have a difficult time producing anything, especially in Russia and Ukraine. I rank their free cash flows 10 out of 10, their revenue 9 out of 10, and their ratio is 10 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.